Hi folks, uh, this is Jason and hope you are okay today. Uh, we're looking at um, the scholarship of Richard Balcom uh, and we're looking at his lectures and his book uh, which is called Jesus and the Eyewitnesses. And um, So we're looking at uh, his scholarship and some of the things that he said in his lectures and I hope this will stimulate you to go and um, read some of uh, Balcom's work. If you type in Richard Balcom, uh, right, and um, you'll be stimulated and, uh, and blessed and encouraged. So let's come before the Lord. Father God, we thank you for this day and we thank you for your love and your grace we give you the praise we give you the glory and the honor and uh, father we thank you for this day and we thank you for this blessings and father we give you the praise we give you the glory and father I pray uh, the thoughts that I share today would be a blessing and a help to people I ask this Lord in your name Amen okay the exercise of this video is just to um, open your mind a little bit to the scholarship that's around today on the study of the historical Jesus and especially in the area of the four Gospels. Richard Balcom has done four lectures at Southern Baptist, Baptist Theological Seminary. Uh, if you type in uh, in YouTube uh, the Gospels as history, uh, Richard Balcom, or Balcom uh, and there you will find uh, one of his lectures and you'll be able to to get other lectures as well um, so these are my notes on his lectures and then uh, also my notes on his book and I'm just going to share what I think um, I've been studying the historical Jesus studies in more and more depth and I'm continually reading other scholars reading his work again and again so it's a continual reflection I've done these notes before but I'm going to be saying new things that you've not heard before giving you new thoughts because I've been studying more and have wider experience than I did a few months ago so I just hope that this will be a, an encouragement to you uh, and a blessing to you First of all, uh, in the first lecture, uh, Balcom, Balcom or Balcom, however you want to pronounce it, um, he he mentions that um, in the 20th century, um, scholars generally denied that the Gospels were not biography. Uh, but he, he states now in the scholarly world that's changed academics uh, have begun to see that actually uh, the Gospels are ancient biography so there's been a sea change um, so I'm just looking at my notes so in his lecture he, he talks about various kind of biographies that were in the first century uh, there were political biographies uh, he talks about the writings of Plutarch uh, he talks about intellectual biographies uh, short biographies in the ancient world he, he talks about um, the historiography and writing of um, various ancient uh, historians um, about how and why they wrote um, how and why they wrote history and then in his lecture he then talks about how the Gospels have to be seen in the context um, how ancient historians wrote how did they write history what were their methods, what were their purpose, how did they write biography, what were their methods, what were their purpose and and so 
in his lecture he, he talks quite a bit about this and then says when we're looking at the Gospels we have to understand these literary productions in the first century context of how history was written he contends in his lectures that the Gospels were written in living memory that there were still eyewitnesses living um, <coughs> He talks about history is about fact and meaning. There is fact and interpretation. And he believes that if you look at the Gospels, you can find traces of eyewitness material. looking at my notes okay, I could go on uh, quite a lot about these lectures I, I find them fascinating uh, I could talk about. He, he goes into the history of history, looking at historians over the years. Uh, he talks about history from below in the 1960s. Uh, he talks about historians such as E.P. Thomas, 1960, early classic uh, historians of 1963. Uh, the history of of above, which is the history of the elite, and basically saying that throughout history there have been a concentration um, that there have been different styles of history where historians have concentrated on certain things. So, for example, um, some historians have concentrated on the history of nations, history. Of variety of perspectives in history um, and this is important because it then it helps us to, de to de define what actually is the methodology of the history of the Gospels and it seems to be that the Gospels were ahead of the time because prior to the Gospels four Gospels being written. History was generally about the big hitters, the generals, the empire, etc. Um, if you look at uh, right up until Voltaire, uh, Voltaire then writes about ordinary people. Um, but that was a big sea shift because most historians throughout history concentrated on either the big famous people or the empire. The four Gospels seem to come most people that are not important which is a completely different historical method which it wasn't until Voltaire, Voltaire uh, discovered or, or uh, made popular so um, the Gospels predate Voltaire by many hundreds of years Um, I, I thought that was an interesting thought. And um, I think uh, because I've got more material written down, um, I've got such a lot of notes on his lectures. Uh, In an essay of his, I'll just get the essay. Uh, 
In an essay of his on the authenticity of apostolic eyewitnessing the New Testament, it talks about how the Gospels were written around the circle of people who knew Jesus and based on apostolic teaching. The form critics saw the Gospels as folk literature but failed to realize that these kind of oral traditions are cultural specific and so failed to pick a lot of kind of false criteria of understanding the Gospels. So in quotes, oral tradition culturally specific quote again Boltman school too generalistic he asked the question in his essay why the names you you get names in Mark chapter 6 verse 3 Mark 10 46 Luke 24 18 and so he he asked that question well why the detailed names in the Gospels He talks about a various phenomenon in ancient literature of his ancient historiography. Um, there were methodologies which historians used as material. They would have the inclusion, which was a common and for more, co common phenomenon in a, in ancient literature, a sort of structure in which a passage. Uh, had a beginning and an end with co corresponding material but indicated who the eyewitness was behind the material that they were writing and he says that this kind of first century style of historiography was in the four gospels so then he writes there are no longer good reasons for supposing that the gospel traditions pass through a lengthy process of oral transmission in the early Christian communities. He writes, on the contrary, it is most plausible to think of the eyewitnesses as living and active, well known throughout the Christian movement down to the time when the Gospels, page 8, page 9, as I have already stated and probably most Gospel scholars now agree, the literary genre to which the four Gospels belong is the ancient genre of biography. He goes on, what we have in the four Gospels, in my view, is good access to the apostolic testimony about Jesus. Um, so that that's um, what he has to say there. Uh, in an article uh, or an essay that he actually wrote and uh, now we're going to get into I'm going to get into his um, book, Jesus and the Eyewitnesses, and then we, we're going to, uh, this because my notes are set out more clearly here, I can talk more freely, I'm sorry I've not been as free in my conversation, but here I can give much more critical assessment now because I've got clearer notes, uh, the, the, more, uh, the more available for uh, uh, reflecting on the, the other notes on, my, on the lectures. Um, um, Riggledy piggledy, they're all over the place. Uh, these notes are set out in neat so I can look at them and process them a lot better. So, okay, we're going to get into uh, depth now and analyze some of the thoughts from uh, Richard Bocum, and then we're going to go into much detail here now. Okay, uh, so this is from the book Jesus and the Eyewitnesses The Gospels as Eyewitness Testimony, Richard Bocum, 2006. Uh, 
on page three it says all history meaning all that history is right all historiography is inextricable combination of fact and interpretation the empirically empirical observable and the invited or constructed meaning I think that is is a very profound statement that Richard Barkham makes there and I'm quite impressed with his statement there I've been reading a book on the history of history I've been reading about the historian Herodotus and many ancient in my own thinking I have come to that conclusion that history is a, is a matter of fact and interpretation and very often in debates between atheists and Christians the discussion is about so-called facts there's very little discussion about interpretation and about how interpretation is moved is dovetailing into our understanding of the facts uh, and I think that's a beautiful statement by Richard Barkham I really do and that that shows his knowledge of history you see Richard Barkham is a theologian but he is also uh, um, he is also um, a historian he's a trained historian and you can see that through that statement that statement shows a mature thinker in historiography he writes by comparison with the Gospels any G by the quest cannot fail to be reductionistic from the perspective of Christian theology I think that that's quite true I think any historian or theologian or anybody who is going to study historical Jesus studies from a scholarly perspective in the academic world there will be a reductionist influence uh, in the 19th century um, when many books were written about Jesus uh, Rain and, and Strauss they were very reductionistic ie they didn't believe in the supernatural but I'm not too sure that it has to be reductionistic because I do think that presuppositions that we bring to history and how we use need to be questioned and I would say that the Christian presuppositions are consistent and valid presuppositions and so on two levels I think that the desire to uh, study data and the looking at presupposition does not necessarily mean your historiography has to be reductionistic however it is necessarily reductionistic in today's academic climate but it doesn't have to be so page 4 by comparison with the Gospels any Jesus reconstructed by the quest cannot fail to be reductionistic from the perspective of Christian facts and theology yes but it doesn't have to be I think uh, methodology presuppositions need to be challenged in and I think a Christian understanding of history is far superior than a secular understanding of history and gives a good foundation for historical inquiry page 4 trusting testimony is not a rational act of faith that leaves critical rationality aside it is on the contrary the rationally appreciated appropriate way of responding to authentic testimony I think there is a debate that needs to be had and would be an interesting debate and discussion and I think a, perhaps a book needs to be written on it in more depth and that is to say what is the philosophical and epistemological implications of historical testimony I think that what we can know of the past depends on a number of factors but one of them is whether testimony is whether the testimony that we're investigating is authentic or not 
Um, I think that knowledge generally is based on testimony. Scientific experiment is based on testimony in the sense that the community of scientists testify to the work of a particular scientist as being accurate. So testimony is by its nature part of human knowledge. Whether you can demarcate historical testimony as being less superior than scientific testimony, that's a mute question. But the point is that testimony is the foundation or part or a central part of and if that's the case, then what are the implications of some historical situation where testimony is given and is good testimony? How do we respond to that? Page 5. It is true that a powerful trend in modern development of critical historical philosophy um, finds trusting testimony a stumbling block in the way of the historian's autonomous access to that she or he can verify independently but it is also a rather neglected fact that all history like all knowledge relies on testimony page five so he's really challenging historians and thinkers to to recognize the fact that you can't get away from testimony if you're going to do history we must recognize that historically speaking testimony is a unique and uniquely valuable means of access to reality you know something I do think he's correct there and I do think that this playing down of testimony in, in epistemology it, it's just silly it, it, testimony is part it's heart is at the heart of our experience of human beings and um, it's no good pretending that it that it isn't and quote, he writes, testimony offers us, I wish to suggest, both a reputable historiography for reading the Gospels as history and also a theological method for understanding the Gospels as entirely appropriate means of access to the historical reality of Jesus. Again, I completely concur with what Richard Borkham is saying here. Completely. Again, I, I think... I, I do think that um, historians, theologians, philosophers uh, just underplay the role of testimony in our knowledge and in the knowledge of history and is an appropriate method for theological reflection. He writes, uh, this is the assumption that the traditions about Jesus, his acts and his words passed through a long process of oral tradition in the early Christian communities and reached the writers of the Gospels only at a late stage of the process. Page 6. He's talking here about form criticism. The idea that uh, Christianity developed over a long period of time and various communities edited the story and embellished the story of the life of Jesus. Mythological. Page 7, he quotes uh, Vincent Taylor, If form critics are right, the disciples must have been translated to heaven immediately after the resurrection. Page 7. I think what he's saying there is that he's striking a blow at form criticism. Form criticism had the idea, very simply, had the idea that Um, that the Gospels developed through communities and these communities got together over time and began to edit, change, modify, build in stories about Jesus fabricate ideas about Jesus but the key word is quote communities and the quote here by Vincent Taylor which Bochum, um quotes in page 7 completely discounts that if the form critics are right notice this this is really important 
the disciples must have been translated to heaven immediately after the resurrection. So, if we take this form critic perspective of Boltman and his followers, that there were these communities um, who were editing and changing and developing the story of Jesus, it doesn't take into account the fact the way the culture was working at the time of Jesus. You see, he built key individuals around him like Peter etc and these would have been alive and managing passing on the tradition so they weren't just nameless communities they were individual people who were the inner circle of Jesus ministry and they would have been around to supervise the passing on of the tradition about Jesus which is a completely different way of looking at it from the form critics and puts things in a whole new perspective a new ball game in historical Jesus studies page 7 now we went on to the point that eyewitness participants in the events of the gospel narratives did not did not go into permanent retreat for at the heart they moved among the young Palestinian communities and through preaching and fellowship their recollections were at the disposal of those who sought information so basically he's striking a blow again against this form critic idea of these nebulous communities changing the story here he's saying no there were these disciples they knew Jesus and they just didn't run away they were there and they were supervising the passing on of the information about Jesus Martin Hengel uh, said talks he quotes Martin Hengel about how the memories of these disciples and about who Jesus was was passed on through these specific kind of people he talks about how Polybius uh, a ancient historian around about 200 BC had a particular way of writing history and that writing history was to get eyewitness material uh, if you read uh, Polybius's writing Polybius clearly states that that if you're going to be a good historian you have to go and get eyewitness material now, I think you have to be careful here I think Balcom or Balcom uh, knows history quite well knows historians quite well but you do have to be careful not to generalize with these ancient historians but Polybius did have a general belief that to be a historian you had to go and try and get eyewitness material if you can now writing um, he wrote around about 200 AD, uh, BC his writing became popular and was a model for historians in Jesus day and after Jesus <coughs> um, some of the Greek words for what Polybius used as seeing um, history as important and the way to write history some of these key Greek words were used by the Apostle Paul and others to indicate that they had a similar method or idea about history that is to say using eyewitness material so I think we'll just read uh, 
So we'll just read uh, Luke chapter 4, uh, chapter 1. We read, Most Honorable Theophilus, many people have written accounts about the events that took place among us. They used as their source material the reports circulating among us from the early disciples and other eyewitnesses of what God has done in fulfillment of his promises. Having carefully investigated all these accounts from the beginning, I have decided to write a careful summary for you to treasure you, to reassure you of the truth of all you were taught. So in that, it's very clear in that writing that that is very similar understanding of history as the ancient historian Polybius who influenced first century historiography. Uh, Bayer Sock says having established the key role of eyewitness testimony in ancient historiography. Um, Biasoc argues that a similar role must have been played in the formation of the gospel tradition. This is Balcom on Bayer uh, Skog, I think it is. Page 10. He goes, the gospel narratives are thus synthesis of history and story of oral history and eyewitnesses and a narrating process of an author. Uh, he quotes uh, Bayer Scoggs, page 10. He writes, uh, the ancient histories, histories know that first-hand insider testimony gave access to truth that could not have been had otherwise, though not thwarted. They were willing to trust the eyewitnesses informants for the so for the sake of the unique access they gained to the truth of the events. So I think it's important um, I do think, I really, really do think this, and this is really important, that if you're going to do historical Jesus to the life of the Lord, then you've got to know what these ancient historians were writing, what they were thinking. And I do think that we as modern historians and modern writers and thinkers need to be challenged about the ancients understanding of history you see they saw a un that testimony had a un give us, gave a unique access into a historical event now I know that in modern times we've concentrated not just on grand narratives of history but we've concentrated on minorities and individuals in our historiography and uh, so there is that kind of tacit recognition of the ancient thinking about history being ate by modern historians. But I do think, as historians and philosophers and theologians and thinkers, we just don't really grapple with the nature of the literature in the time of Jesus and after concerning how historians wrote. We really, really don't grapple with it and it's good to see Richard Balcom do that so Richard Balcom noticed various Greek words such as inquired um, anikirinen uh, this was a Greek word that had a judicial context and so history was seen by uh, historians like Polybius and Lucifer as giving uh, a testimony that can stand up to scrutiny. 
writes on page 14, the sources of oral historians are reminiscences, reminiscences, sorry, the source of an oral historian are reminiscences, hearsay or eyewitness accounts about events and situations which are contemporary, that is, which occurred during the lifetime of the informants. This differs from oral tradition in that oral traditions are this differs from oral tradition in that oral traditions are no longer contemporary they have passed from mouth to mouth for a period beyond beyond the lifetime of the informants the two situations typically are very So I'll just stop there because I can't read my handwriting there, but basically what Balkan is saying, and I think this is borne out by the research of James Dunn as well uh, in his Hayes lectures that you can look at, but basically um, the form critics basically said that the Gospels were basically an oral tradition, yeah. This oral tradition can be passed on from generation to generation and, and change. Uh, it's quite mythological in its in its in its development. But what Borkham is saying is if you know oral tradition is culturally specific, which I said earlier on in the video. And being culturally specific is was based, there is a a difference between oral tradition and being an oral historian. In the ancient world, in Jesus' time, in Jesus' area, there were oral historians. That is, people passing on the traditions, but in an oral historical way, making sure eyewitness accounts, reminiscences and hearsay were passed on. which is a completely radical different way of looking at it from the form critics but here's the point it is based on eyewitness accounts it's a cultural specific understanding of the way people did history in the time of Jesus page 14 this makes the particular passage from Papias very precious evidence of the way in which gospel traditions were understood to be related to the eyewitnesses at the very time when when where our Calico gospels excuse me being written I'll read that again this makes the part particular passage from Papias very precious evidence of the way in which gospel traditions were understood to be related to the eyewitnesses at the very time when the can canonical gospels were being written, page 14. So what he's saying there is, look, if you look at the historical context of when the gospels were written, they were written in the context of oral historians rather than oral tradition and oral historians is culturally when we're talking about oral tradition of any sort you have to be culturally specific the point being here is this way of understanding history um, and the way, the reason why the Gospels wrote i.e. trying to pass on the eyewitness testimony all this shows us um, to be more critical of those scholars and thinkers who just said Christianity is a myth because it developed over time. The facts are it doesn't take into consideration the nuanced historical context of the Gospels. And I think um, the problem that I have here, there's one or two issues that I have here now. 
Um, page 14 again. This makes the particular passage from Papias very precious, evidence of the way in which the gospel traditions were understood and related to the eyewitnesses. I want to say one or two things here which are really important. I think it's very important to realize that we're dealing with very complex historical information. That it's not at all as easy to put all the pieces together in looking at the history. There are some complex, difficult issues to think about in that process. So having said that, I think it's a bit simplistic of Richard Barkham to take a passage about Papias by Papias and to deduce a whole theory of ancient historiography and how that might dovetail into the Gospels. I think it's a part of the other evidence. I think it's an interesting part and a good part of the evidence, but it has to be uh, supplanted with other evidences a wider afield. The significance of Papias is he's mentioned by Eusebius um, and Eusebius mentions Papias uh, who said he knew Philip's daughter, daughters, that he was a guy who, who um, goes right back to the disciples or the apostles, or people that they knew. And I think the problem with that is it can be a little bit simplistic because if you read Eusebius, there are some tough questions to ask. For example, he says that Papius um, in, said that it was the elder John who wrote the Gospel of John and not John himself. So in the one hand, uh, Bal Balcom is taking um, historical information about Papias and deducing certain things. Difficult questions as well. But uh, the Papias passage shows how there was an interest uh, and saw the importance of uh, eyewitness material. He goes, the historians, the historian strict principle of historiography were like those of Thucydides, something of an idol for later historians. Again, noting the importance of looking at this literature in its historical context. Uh, he writes, Papias belonged, roughly speaking, to the... And again, he makes that link in Eusebius, Ecclesiastes, Chapter 3, verse 39, verse 9. Well, Papias is a very significant uh, person in the origin of Christianity and in the Gospels. Uh, he figures very important. Eusebius, who quotes him, is not impressed by, by um, Papias. He thinks that Papias is... Um, substandard um, and the reason is because there were different views on the end times and those who followed the gospel uh, uh, the Apostle John uh, idea of end times uh, some of the early church fathers had problems with and that and such as Eusebius but Papius is is important because we do get an understanding of how people were thinking about the Gospels. But again, I think you have to be careful. History can be fragmentary and sometimes we don't have all the facts, so we have to hold things in tension. Um, 
uh, J.D. Dunn says, history meaning an eyewitnesses. He thinks it's collective memory. Just for a second. Uh, just having a break just for a minute. I'm just going to play back. Um, the last bit there. Um, just so I can follow my own thoughts. Roughly speaking, to the and again, he makes that link in Eusebius Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 39, verse 9. But Papias is a very significant uh, person in the origin of Christianity, uh, he figures very important. Eusebius, who quotes him. He's not impressed by by um, Papius. He thinks that Papius is um, substandard, um, and the reason is because there were different views on the end times. And those who followed the gospel, uh, uh, the Apostle John, uh, idea of end times, and uh, some of the other church fathers had problems with. And that, and so it is Eusebius. But Papius is, is important because we do get an understanding of how people were thinking about the Gospels. But again, I think you have to be careful. History can be. Sometimes we don't have all the facts, so we have to hold things in tension. Um, Yeah. Okay. So we have to hold things in tension. Um, that is to say that when we're doing historiography, there there are. Um, there are difficulties and we get some clear lines of evidence but we get lines of evidence that are not as clear or seem to be contradictory and sometimes we have to hold that in tension and so Papius is a wonderful example of information about uh, the nature of how the Gospels might have been written uh, and excellent information about the Gospels but at the same time um, you know there are some difficult questions to answer as well concerning the nature of that evidence um, and it's we have to be intellectually honest and recognize the challenges and struggles that we have as historians on page 93 Richard Barkham says in his book the four critics did not think much of the information which the ancient church provides concerning the concrete persons behind the Gospels, not even the personal retinues in the New Testament. The notion of creative community makes questions of concrete traditions uninteresting. This depersonal contagious effect right to the present it still regularly happens that people blithely speak about products of the church uh, and traditions which circulated in the communities instead of asking who has formulated the reef or reformulated or transmitted a certain text so what he's saying there is that there is this persistent unfair way of looking at the historical material concerning the Gospels. There is this tacit desire to talk about 
generalities. Also a desire to undermine what the church is saying about certain individuals. So when the church is saying that Ignatius and Polycarp and Irenaeus are in how we understand how the Gospels came to us, the form critics and other critics will just dismiss that and to see that as not important, that they will have ideas about various communities that they think have shaped the Christian formulations. Often these ideas are based on nothing but supposition, nothing but uh, vague uh, thoughts that are not actually rooted in, in the apostolic tradition in, or not rooted in how actual how the actual history did take place because there is not taken seriously the the importance of individual key people who were managing that tradition. Page ninety five that Jesus himself appointed twelve of his disciples for a special place in his mission of renewing and restoring God's people, Israel has been doubted by some scholars following the lead of Rudolf Bultmann who have supposed that the notion of the twelve original only later. However, a large majority of recent scholars has accepted it, especially since it adheres so well with the trends to understand Jesus in thoroughly Jewish terms, page 95. So what Richard Bochum is doing here now is undergirding his idea of historical tradition undergirding his idea that there were these specific key people managing the tradition by showing that scholarly consensus consensus has moved over to this kind of thinking. Page 95 he writes the appointment of 12 constituted several scholars have argued a, a prophetic sign of what God was doing He writes, it is not difficult to imagine that their role in the earliest Christian community would include that of authoritative transmissions of the sayings of Jesus and of the eyewitness of the events of Jesus' history. If any group in the early community was responsible for such a kind of formulation of structure of a body of Jesus' tradi tradition, then the twelve are as much the most obviously likely to have been that group. So again, he's, he's putting the argument here that the Gospels were written by specific individual people and why couldn't it? Could it not have been? Why could it not have been the twelve disciples? And if that is the case, what uh, in understanding our history of the Gospels? Uh, just a, a, an interesting note, if we look at the Gospels and the grammar of the names, they're very similar to the archaeological evidence that we found in that area of Jerusalem, where in proportion to the population size of first century Judaism, exactly mirrors the, the, the four Gospels. In other words, um, how society was made up in first century Jerusalem, how that society was made up in its numbers and the names that it used, the people's names, because these people would die and we find their their um, their graves and, and what have you. So we know the kind of names that were being used of Jesus and it directly agrees the archaeological evidence agrees with the distribution of names in the Gospels in the same proportion is, 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 is highlighted in the archaeological evidence as well. So the names of the Gospels correspond to the reality of the actual first century Jerusalem. Again, Barcom goes on to do in-depth study on inclusion, 
the way Greek historians and Roman historians wrote, using the inclusion uh, as a markation, demarcation of showing that there is eyewitness material. He uses that to show there is eyewitness material in the Gospel of Mark, for example, because the Greek and Roman historical method was used in, in the Gospels. So we've come to our last quote, um, page 163. Studies of the point of view in Mark have missed the plural to singular narrative device characteristic through it. It is a Mark's gospel. It is a form of internal focalization. What Borkham is saying is that the way the gospels wrote, for example, Mark, the way the grammar was written, there was internal focal focalization. That is to say, the language was used, was produced in such a way as to indicate the eyewitness material within the text. Just exactly how ancient historians of the time wrote. So we, we've come to the end of uh, my notes on Richard Balcom, or Balcom. I say Richard Balcom. Uh, we've come to the end of my notes. Uh, my conclusion, what, 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 what are my overall conclusions for me? Well, for me, uh, this is just the beginning. I think I'm in a great big quest at the moment to read as much as I can. And it stimulated me to study more about history. I'm working through uh, uh, some historians at the moment, Herodotus, Polybius, uh, Livy, um, and many others and I want to understand history and how that history in ancient times impacted the writing of the Gospels. I think the other thing that I like about Bog and he reassesses them and I think it shows that there has been a bias in the academic world concerning the four Gospels because it used form criticism with such a straitjacket that it stopped scholars actually looking at evidences that was right under their noses. So I admire uh, Balcom for doing that. I admire him that he, he um, you know, he's a scholar that, that thinks deeply and goes widely. I, I like the reassessment of Papias, how he reassesses that and gets new information and how he uses that as a base to show there is probably eyewitness material in the Gospels purely from that piece of literature, purely from an analysis of Papias. I think it's very dangerous to take information like Papias and develop some, some argument without having wider evidences. And so it can be a bit too simplistic and unless you're a specialist in the field, uh, you wouldn't really appreciate that sometimes uh, Barkham is a bit too simplistic. Having said that, uh, you can't take away there is a nuanced sophistication within his writing. So I have to give him that as well. But I, but I think the nature of historiography, you can be, you, you, you can sometimes slip into overgeneralization. I think that Balkan has done that sometimes. Um, to me, I think there's more work to be done. I think there's more work to be done on ancient historiography and how that relates to the Gospels. And for me, I will do that. Uh, his book gives you a lot of uh, strength and help as a Christian in terms of defending your faith. Um, but I think I think there are wider evidences as well that we have to consider. We have to consider not just Papias, but Irenaeus, Ignatius, Polycarp. We have to consider the Gnostic Gospels and critique them. Um, and the book just is making a point that 
we're making a big mistake when we're looking at the Gospels. We should be looking and recognizing eyewitness material. I think if he's, if that's his intention, then his book has succeeded. So those are my thoughts. I, I think um, I would encourage you to read the book uh, and uh, get back to me. So thank you for listening and God bless you.